Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report. I'm Steve Lance. The latest jobs report is out and it's beating the experts' predictions. According to data released today, the labor market added 253,000 jobs last month. That increase surprised economists. Industry experts were expecting about 180,000 jobs to be added and were expecting job growth to decline for the third consecutive month. The overall unemployment rate fell slightly from 3.5 percent to 3.4 percent. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates yet again on Wednesday, but hinted that if the economy and jobs continue to slow, the Fed could pause rate hikes. This latest jobs report could change that, meaning more rate hikes could be on the horizon. To react to the latest job report, including the recent interest rate hike and the overall health of the economy, we have Virginia Congressman Bob Good. Congressman Bob Good, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Steve. Congressman, the jobs report uh, just released today, better than expected, uh, 253,000 jobs added, unemployment dipping. However, it appears to be a, a potential double-edged sword. Uh, if you kind of break it down, how do you see it? Well, Secretary Powell's policy of 5% uh, raise in interest rates over the past year is crushing the American people. Uh, when home prices are rising, when inventory is low, and now a mortgage costs some 50, 75 percent more than it did a year ago, devastating to Americans, and frankly, in my view, ill placed that he continues to do this. He's doubled down on it. It's misguided policy. Historically, interest rates are increased, as you know, to try to slow a hot economy and to ward off potential inflation. In this case, we've caused the inflation with the massive spending. We don't have a strong economy, and yet he's crushing the American people with these debt ceiling. Yellen, equally derelict in her responsibility as Treasury Secretary, they will not call out the administration, their boss, for the massive spending that's causing so many problems. Congressman, meanwhile, as you mentioned, uh, we have a, a debt ceiling uh, crisis potentially looming here. What is the current situation and is there a path forward? Well, the good news is there's been a debt ceiling deal negotiated. It took place over the last two months in the House. Uh, you had most of us on the conservative side did not want to raise the debt ceiling at all, but we were willing to have a responsible conversation to work out a reasonable plan that to raise it by a modest number by Washington standards, 1.5 trillion, in return for about $5 trillion in cuts over 10 years, about a trillion dollars up front, and, and eliminating a lot of obviously wasteful, reckless spending and the reforms to get us on a path to fiscal responsibility. So the House has done its work while the Senate was on the sidelines, the White House has been on the sidelines. Now the House is united in our resolve to say, Senate, pass this bill. Uh, do your job. Uh, this is the bill that got us a majority in the House. We cannot get another bill out of the House with a majority. So I believe if we hold strong, the Senate will pass it, and I believe the White House will sign it. You touched upon it. Uh, outside of the debt limit, we're seeing economic pressures bearing down on our country from inflation, uh, more interest rate hikes, banks failing. Uh, what do you make of all of this, and, and where are things heading? Well, you've got Biden inflation on full display, which is crushing Americans. As you know, the gas pump at the grocery store, utility prices, housing prices, uh, and it's crushing regular income Americans. At the same time, you've got the Biden uh, Fed chair is raising interest rates again, as we mentioned a moment ago, which is crushing Americans. You've got uh, the lowest labor participation rate we've had in our history. Uh, that's why, again, part of our debt ceiling increase bill is getting Americans back to work, reinstating work requirements for able-bodied working age Americans who don't have dependents in return for federal subsistence. That's an 80 percent issue. Most Americans support that. It's reasonable. The Democrats are against it. You know, it's funny, Steve. Democrats measure success by how many people they get on public assistance. Republicans measure success by how many people we move off of public subsistence to get them to be self-reliant and to have the dignity and the, and, the, and the value of the virtue of work as part of, you know, who they are. And so uh, the Biden economy is crushing Americans. We've got to go back to the Trump pro-growth policies. We can't get there with 1 percent growth. We've got to go back to that 3 4 4% growth we were enjoying under the Trump economy. Meanwhile, you've also recently introduced legislation to curb uh, taxpayer money from going to the United Nations to fund uh, climate change initiatives. Um, why is this important to you? Why does it matter? Well, and, and even speaking to the negotiations on this debt ceiling increase, Many of us on the conservative side wanted to defund the U.N. and defund the W.H.O. We're going to take another stab at that in the appropriations process this summer and this fall. But why are we borrowing money 
to send hard-earned taxpayer money to burden our kids and our grandkids with funding the UN, to funding, uh, worse yet, the climate initiatives at the UN. Biden just committed a billion dollars more to that. We want to rescind that, of course. This is the same UN, by the way, Steve, that is uh, uh, coaching illegal aliens on how to cheat our asylum system with the dollars we send to the UN. And then as an extension of that, the WHO, which is corrupt, it's controlled by communist China. We saw how corrupt they were, how dishonest they were uh, with the COVID, uh, the China virus situation. And we've got the administration, as you know, intent on surrendering our national sovereignty uh, to the WHO when it comes to future pandemics. And we want to pull out of that as well and keep that from happening. If I might add, it's also the same UN that gives China uh, veto power right. over its human rights abuses and, and everything else. So, uh, Congressman Bob Good, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Great to be with you again. Now over to a story about giving someone a voice when the rest of the media tried to silence him. Brendan Straka, founder of the Walkaway Movement, was put under house arrest after January 6th, and most media outlets stopped reporting on his case. Brandon Straka is with us now to share his insight on how Tucker Carlson's departure will affect the media landscape. Brandon Straka, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Of course, Brandon. Uh, if I could just get your initial reaction uh, when you first heard the news that Tucker Carlson was exiting Fox, and what does this ultimately mean, do you think, for Fox News and the conservative media landscape as a whole? Well, Initially, I was shocked about the news about Tucker Carlson. Obviously, we're talking about the top-rated cable news program, and uh, that's a pretty drastic decision that Fox would make to get rid of their top-rated host. And and Tucker's a you know a brilliant man and quite an asset to Fox. Um, but what I think it means for the future of where things are headed, I'm actually very excited in many ways because I think that Tucker is somebody who really has the power to pull an enormous audience in a brand new direction. What I'm hoping is that. Whatever his next move is going to be, it's not necessarily that he's just going to jump onto another network or do something like that. But I'm really hoping that Tucker will take this opportunity to revolutionize the way in which we consume news. Uh, because I think a lot of people are feeling at this point let down by the major cable news network, by the mainstream media on both sides of the aisle. Um, in terms of what I think it means for Fox, I mean, I think that Fox has been letting its audience down for a while now. I mean, this began before 2020, but certainly it's in, around the election of 2020, I think that it um, it alienated a great deal of its base. And then this has sort of been a slow sort of wind down since then. I think at this point, people are really hungry for truthful information that they feel like it's not being suppressed by corporate entities or you know, the, the, the big wigs who, who own these networks, that we're actually going to get accurate, truthful information. And that's why my hope is that the next move that Tucker makes is something that really revolutionizes the way we consume our news. Very interesting point, Brandon. Um, you know, Tucker gave you a voice when no one else seemed to, to be doing so, but it's not just you, it's so many that say that he truly gave a voice to the voiceless. In your opinion, what sets Tucker Carlson apart from other journalists in today's media uh, landscape? Well, I think that he really has a mission to portray the truth to, to the, his audience, and I think that he, uh, doesn't he's not interested in being owned uh, by uh, corporations or delivering a message that the corporate sponsors want him to deliver? He wants to get to the truth of what's. I think he cares about the world around us. I think he cares about what's happening in our government and in our society. I think he cares about what happened to me. You know, I, before January sixth, uh, I was a pretty well-known, beloved figure in the world of culture and politics, doing my walkaway campaign. Yeah, which I still am, but. When that happened to me, it's almost as though most media outlets bought into the narrative that this was a radioactive topic and wouldn't even allow me to get my voice out or to, to tell my side of the story. And Tucker was one of the few people who did that because I think that he saw the way in which January 6th, along with so many other stories, were being manipulated uh, by government, by the media. And he wanted to give a voice to me and I think other people to be able to get the truth out about that. So I think the bottom line is that he, he actually cares about the truth, he cares about the world around him. And, uh, and he realizes that the situation that we're all in, this is a drastic, dire situation. Um, if people don't wake up and start understanding what we're really facing, uh, we're going to be in big trouble in any short order. So I think that's what motivates him. Brandon, could you just kind of share with us uh, your experience sitting down with Tucker Carlson uh, for over an hour, and then I'm sure you spent a little bit of time before and after. What was he like on a personal level? 
Yeah, so I actually have done talk to show five or six times, but I had the opportunity to sit down with him for an hour uh, exactly a year ago in May of 2022. This would have been right after I got off of house arrest for January 6th. Um, at that time in my life, I w it was a very, very difficult time. I myself was feeling very broken with everything that I'd gone through, and I didn't really know what to expect. I've done a lot of media, and sometimes they kind of, you know, an assistant brings you onto the set, you sit down, you do the interview, you bang it out, and then they walk you off the set, and that's it. Um, I can tell you in the case with Tucker, from the moment I walked in the door, uh, he was making jokes. He was extremely lighthearted and jovial. Uh, I saw the side of his sense of humor that we don't see all the time on the, the nighttime news show, which was a lot of fun. And when we finished the interview, I said to him, you know, there's something I would really like to talk to you about on a personal level. Um, is there some way I could get in touch with you? And, uh, and he said to me, he was like, yeah, just call me later today. And I, I said, really? And he said, yeah, absolutely. He's like, um, I have another interview to, to record, but give me a call and we can talk. Um, and to me, I, that almost felt a little too intimate and personal. So at this point, I texted back and forth with him. But I can tell you, every time I've ever sent him a text message, he always responds. And it's not a quick two or three words. It's a very thoughtful reply that indicates that he read it and contemplated it and thought about it. Sometimes he's extremely humorous when he messages you back. But he never gives this impression that he's too busy or that you're being bothersome. Um, to me, he, he's treated me very much like somebody who really cares about what's going on or why I'm communicating with him. He seems like a very real person with a great sense of humor and a really big heart. I think he's an amazing person. Brandon Strachan, thank you so much for taking some time for us. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com.